So far we've covered a number of introductory issues and we're finally ready to look at this reformed hermeneutic in more detail. So we started off by explaining some key terms, hermeneutics, broad rules, guidelines, principles for interpretation, exegesis, the application of those rules, eisegesis, a danger we want to avoid, and then homiletics or application, and again the balance between those terms. And we also anticipated the objection, hermeneutics, smermeneutics, and saw that it is indeed a necessary, valid part of a good interpretation of scripture. And so now with that prep work out of the way, we're ready to look at what goes into a reformed hermeneutic. Again, reformed, very similar to broad evangelical as we stand within the Protestant tradition. And in my paradigm or in my outline, I suggest to you that there are five hermeneutical principles that we need to think about. So these are five headings that kind of give you a helpful way to subsume various discussions under one of these different categories. And so before we look at them in greater detail, let me explain to you where they come from. Of course, in a certain sense, they don't come directly from the Bible. It's not like we can turn to Ephesians 7. I picked that text by deliberation, as you can understand, because it doesn't exist. But it's not like we can turn to Ephesians 7, verse 6, and Paul says that there are five things that should go into a good hermeneutic. And so we don't get it directly from Scripture, but it's more of an inference from Scripture, how Scripture was revealed to us and how we ought then to interpret it. And historically, um, interpreters have often talked about three different categories, and let me share those with you in case in your reading you come across them. They often use the word grammatical, historical, and theological. Those are the three. But then I took those three and I added another one. You can see I added literary. I'll explain what that is because it wasn't as if they didn't know about literary in the past, but that has kind of blossomed into a whole new area that I think is worthy and helpful to have as a separate category. So that then gave me four. Grammatical, now literary as a new one, historical, and theological. But then there was another one I added at the very beginning, the one that we're going to turn to in just a minute, and that is the Holy Spirit element. It usually isn't talked about in hermeneutical discussions and is more of a presupposition underlying the hermeneutical process. But I think there's much wisdom and value in making this assumption a lot more explicit. And so now I've added it to my reformed hermeneutic, and then I end up with five then, as you see before you, the Holy Spirit element, the grammatical element, the literary element, the historical element, and the theological element. And if these terms aren't familiar to you now, don't worry, they will be at the end of our survey of these terms uh, together. And so in this section, we're going to turn to the first one, and that is, again, the Holy Spirit element. And let me spell out to you again and stress that the first one is indeed different than the other four. Of course you say it's different, it has a different name. No, I mean it's different in character than the other four. Again, it's more of a presupposition that underlies or undergirds the remaining four. And the first one is more of a subjective category because it's hard to analyze or to put the Holy Spirit under the microscope, so to say, in a way that the other four are not. The other four are more objective categories. And so the first one is indeed uh, distinct from the remaining ones. Well then, that's the name that I've given to this approach that I want you to think about as you interpret the Bible, as you seek to read the Bible for all it's worth. What do we mean by the Holy Spirit element? Well, I mean this. And when I slow down, that usually means I think my words are important because I speak quickly. I apologize for that. I had the nickname Motor Mouth in high school. You can understand why. I was on a camping trip with a bunch of students and uh, you know how sound carries on the water and my teacher yelled out in front of all my classmates he said Wyma why don't you stick your head under the water and use your tongue as a propeller so I apologize for speaking quickly but when I slow down that means that what I what I what I'm about to say I think is important and I'm hoping you'll have time then to maybe make notes about it or to better capture the idea so here we go again the Holy Spirit element what do I mean by that I mean that the same Spirit of God that inspired the biblical writers to record God's revelation, 
that spirit now needs to work in our hearts and our minds to properly interpret that revelation. Let me say that again. The same spirit of God that inspired Paul and and Peter and Isaiah and Amos and all the biblical writers to record God's revelation, that same Holy Spirit needs to work in our hearts and our minds to properly interpret that revelation. We often give uh, this function of the Holy Spirit, because the Holy Spirit has a number of functions or purposes, we often give it the function, the illuminating work of the Holy Spirit. Maybe you've heard that term before. It's the idea that sin darkens our mind, our understanding, and so we can't really, in our sin-tainted brain, comprehend what God is saying in His Word. And so the Holy Spirit comes along and sheds light on that darkness and allows us to know and to hear and to accept uh, the will of God. In fact, many churches have in their liturgy a prayer for illumination. I don't know if the liturgists always realize it, but that's a very specific prayer. It doesn't come at the beginning of the service. It doesn't come at the end. It always comes right before the reading and the proclamation of the word. And this is not a prayer where we give congregational concerns and we pray for problems around the world. No, this is a very fixed prayer for the Spirit of God to be present through the reading and proclamation of the word. And that is, again, then, the illuminating work of the Holy Spirit. Well, there's a biblical basis for this idea, and so let me share some of those texts with you. A couple of them come from the Gospel of John, the Upper Room Discourse. John 14, 26 reads as follows. But the Counselor, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, will teach you all things and will remind you of everything I have said to you. And a second one, uh, similar in those five upper room sayings of Jesus, John 16, 13 to 15. When the spirit of truth comes, he will guide you into all the truth. He will take what is mine and declare it to you. So in both of these texts, we read about how the spirit, in a sense, takes what belongs to Jesus and makes it known to you or declares it to you. We have here the spirit's role in taking the meaning and the words and the significance of Jesus' life and impressing those truths upon his followers. Notice that then the Spirit has a strongly Christological focus. The Holy Spirit doesn't speak or draw attention to himself. It's always drawing attention to Christ. I use the analogy often of floodlights in front of a church or a big building. When people drive by, uh, we, we don't hope they say, oh, check out those lights. The whole purpose of the lights is to draw attention to the building. And in a certain sense, the Holy Spirit's function is not to draw attention to himself, but rather to Christ. And then finally, notice also in the John 16 text how he is identified. He's identified as the spirit of truth. He's identified as one who guides us into all the truth. And so that's, of course, what we're talking about when we read and try to interpret the scripture. We want to know the truth that is found in the word of God. Well, the Apostle Paul also knows about the illuminating work of uh, the Holy Spirit. In chapter 2 of 1 Corinthians, let me set up the context for you before I read the text. Uh, The Corinthians were, um, well, frankly, a little bit embarrassed about the gospel, at least the gospel the way that Paul preached it. And so Paul, throughout these opening chapters of 1 Corinthians, has this contrast pair between wisdom and foolishness, wisdom and foolishness, because the Corinthians thought that a lot of their neighbors viewed the gospel as foolishness and they were in a culture where everyone wanted to be wise and to be impressive and so Paul comes along and in a sense rebukes the Corinthians and says wait a minute we do have a wisdom Uh, it may be foolishness to the world but it's a wisdom to us and he says this about it he says God has revealed it that is wisdom which is just another word for truth, which is just another word for God's will, what he has done and how he's called us to live. God has revealed it to us by his spirit. The spirit searches all things, even the deep things of God. For who among men knows the thoughts of a man except the man's spirit within him? In the same way, no one knows the thoughts of God except the spirit of God. So Paul in this quote is using an analogy. You know, analogies, one thing is like another. 
Paul says, you can't know what another person is thinking. In fact, only the spirit of the person can know what he or she is thinking. So if we, if we tried it out for a minute now, okay, I'm, I'm just thinking about something. So you, you tell me what I'm thinking about. It's kind of hard, isn't it? I mean, in fact, it's impossible for you to know what I'm thinking about, right? Only I or my spirit can know what I'm thinking about. And Paul says, well, now the same thing is true of God. No one can know God, he says, except the Spirit of God. And the good news, he says to the Corinthians and to you and me, is that we have the Spirit. These truths, this wisdom, has been revealed to us. Now, there's a little bit, though, uh, a bit of debate here between what kind of knowledge does the Spirit give us. But let's first look at this next text. It's just a couple of verses from the one we just read. Paul says, the person without the Spirit does not accept the things that come from the Spirit of God, but considers them foolishness. And what's more, this person who doesn't have the Spirit cannot understand udunatai gnonai, right? He is unable to know them because they are discerned only through the Spirit. So Paul is pretty clear here between a believer and an unbeliever and how crucial the Spirit's role is in Now what? And here's a bit of the debate. Does the Holy Spirit cause us to know the truth? Or does the Holy Spirit also cause us to accept the truth? Or to put it differently, is it possible for a non-Christian to, in a certain sense, know the Bible? Is it possible for a non-Christian scholar with all of his or her gifts and abilities to, so to say, hear the voice of God and then the Holy Spirit doesn't so much deal with knowledge as he does with accepting it as true. Or might you argue that, wait a minute, true knowledge, not just regular knowledge, but a true knowledge involves some kind of acceptance of the truth. And so think about that. Is the Holy Spirit, the illuminating work of the Holy Spirit, one that reveals truth to us, helps us to know the truth? Or, more than that, also does the Holy Spirit cause us to accept that truth, to hear it as truth, and to believe it? Now, the Reformers, so we have a biblical basis for the illuminating work of the Holy Spirit. I just gave you a few brief texts. And the Reformers were well aware of this hermeneutical principle, even though maybe they didn't always call it a hermeneutical principle. They were well aware of the illuminating work of the Holy Spirit and how crucial the Spirit was in the interpretation process. Here we have a quote from Martin Luther. He says, No person perceives one iota, not even a little bit of what's in the Scriptures, unless he or she has the Spirit of God. All people have a darkened heart, so that even if they can recite everything in Scripture and know how to quote it, yet they apprehend and truly understand nothing of it. For the Spirit is required for the understanding of Scripture, both as a whole and in any part of it. So Luther strongly affirmed the crucial role that the Spirit plays in the interpretation, in the knowing, in the accepting of the truth process. John Calvin also has an interesting quote in a sermon on 1 Timothy 3. He says, When we come to hear the sermon or to take up the Bible, we must not have the foolish arrogance of thinking we shall easily understand everything we hear or read. And before we go any further, I'm, I'm struck by that, and hopefully you are too. Remember, John Calvin is the same guy who argued for, as we talked about earlier, the perspicuity of Scripture, the clarity of Scripture. And yet the same guy who argued for the perspicuity of Scripture says, we should not have the foolish arrogance of thinking we shall easily understand everything we hear or read. Is Calvin contradicting what he said earlier? No. Calvin, as we said to you earlier, must have made a distinction between a more narrow view of perspicuity, right, limited to those things that are essential for salvation compared to what the whole of Scripture teaches. And what's more, I like the way Calvin puts it. If you're the kind of hermeneutics, smermeneutics person that we talked about earlier, he says that you are foolishly arrogant. But anyway, what is the right posture we should have? He says we should come with reverence. We must wait entirely upon God, knowing that we need to be taught by his Holy Spirit and that without him, that is the Spirit, we cannot understand anything that is shown to us in his word. 
That's a pretty strong affirmation of how crucial the Spirit's role is in the interpretation process. Without Him, we can't understand. And I would add, on the basis of Paul's text, we also cannot understand it. We also can't accept it as the Word of God. Now, Klaus Runia is a theologian from the Netherlands who surveyed not only Calvin, not only Luther, but all the reformers, and his survey of their writings highlighted for him how, how strong they affirm this illuminating work of the Holy Spirit. Here's a quote that he has. Finally, if we want to come to a truly biblical hermeneutics, we must realize that the, with the reformers that the word of God cannot be understood without the illumination of the Spirit of God. The final key to the hermeneutics of the reformers is the confession, Spiritus Sanctus es Veris Interpretus Scripturae. Translated, the Holy Spirit is the true interpreter of Scripture. Therefore, the beginning and end of all biblical hermeneutics is the humble prayer, Veni Creator Spiritus, come Creator Spirit. And so this is a summary, his summary of what all the reformers stressed. And I like the way he said that the beginning and the end is that prayer. That ought to be the prayer that we use when we open God's word and we seek to implement our hermeneutic and do exegesis. We ought to pray, Veni Creator Spiritus, come Creator Spirit. But it's not only the reformers, it's even within the broader evangelical camp, a wide recognition for the illuminating work of the Holy Spirit. James Packer is a well-known evangelical and a good person for us to use as, a, as an example uh, of this uh, belief. He says, the characteristic procedures and techniques of evangelical hermeneutics are now before us, and it remains only to add, you see, he's He's done things the opposite way that I have, right? He's taken the other principles that we're going to talk about. And now at the end, he adds about the illuminating work of the Holy Spirit. I think it's better and more fitting to put it on the front end and to recognize it as a presupposition that underlies the whole process. So he says, it remains only to add, right, in addition to all the things, Packer says, I've already talked to you about hermeneutics, to add that the evangelical way of practicing them involves radical dependence on the Holy Spirit, a dependence that is expressed by prayer for wisdom and insight before, during, and after the hermeneutical exercise itself. Evangelicals do not forget that sin as an inbred anti-God perversity of the soul, disables minds from understanding God, no less than it disables wills from obeying Him. So that divine help is needed at every stage of the process of receiving the divine message. It's a long sentence. It's one of those Pauline long run-on ones. But if you look at it again carefully, you can see there the words he talked about, a radical dependence on the Holy Spirit, right? Before, during, and after the whole hermeneutical process. Bob Stein comes from a Baptist background and has a nice little book on hermeneutics, more user-friendly title, Playing by the Rules, but he too affirms the same thing. He says, it would appear that what the reformers called illumination refers to understanding the meaning of the text, conviction to the attribution of a positive significance to the text. In other words, the Spirit helps the reader understand the pattern of meaning that the author willed, and the Spirit does something else, convinces the reader as to the truth of that teaching. Henry Verkler, whom we've quoted in the past, has also a helpful comment here. One attempt to resolve this dilemma, this has to do with the point I raised earlier, there's a bit of debate about whether the work of the Holy Spirit makes known to us the truth or whether the Holy Spirit causes us to accept that truth. And one attempt to resolve this dilemma on the Spirit's role in the interpretation process is based on a definition of the term no. According to the scriptures, persons do not truly possess knowledge unless they are living in the light of that knowledge. True faith is not only knowledge about God, which even the demons possess, but knowledge acted upon. The unbeliever can know, that is, intellectually comprehend, many truths of the scripture using the same interpretation, the same hermeneutic he would use with non-biblical text. But 
the non-Christian cannot truly know, that is, act on and appropriate those truths, as long as he or she remains in rebellion against God. That text he quotes from uh, James is an important one. James says, do you believe that God is one? And of course, writing to a Jewish audience, this is an allusion to the Shema, Shema Yisrael, hear O Israel, the Lord our God is one. And James says, well, big deal, even the demons know or believe that and shudder. And so again, there's a difference between knowledge in the sense of intellectual apprehension and true knowledge by which you accept and appropriate in which you, so to say, submit your life to and uh, believe. Now, I've given a definition of the Holy Spirit element. I've given a biblical basis for that idea. I've talked about how it was stressed in the Reformers and how it's still acknowledged in the broader Reformed and Evangelical community today. But before we finish this first uh, principle, this first hermeneutical guideline, I would like to spell out for you some consequences of this principle. The first consequence is this. It ought to instill in you and me an attitude of humility before the text. It's not as if I'm standing on top of the Bible, armed with my PhD degree and my knowledge of the Greek and Hebrew language and the historical context and all the other things, as if I'm in control of the Bible. But actually, it's just the opposite. Instead of standing on top of the Bible, I stand underneath the Scriptures. There's a powerful sense that no matter how talented I am, no matter how knowledgeable I may be, no matter how hardworking I am, without the Spirit's illuminating presence, I will not properly know and accept the will of God. And so it ought to instill in me and in you a sense of humility before the text. And I hope that uh, in our time together that I will demonstrate this uh, humility uh, you know, uh, for the word of God. Second, the illuminating work of the Holy Spirit does not take away the need for a careful study of Scripture. There are some people, I'm afraid, who in an unhealthy way rely on, I would argue, maybe abuse the presence of the Spirit. This is the idea, well, okay, maybe I didn't work hard enough on this passage or maybe I didn't spend enough time on it, but, well, the Holy Spirit will help me and that will somehow, he will somehow take care of all of this. A quote from uh, Robert Stein is helpful in this regard. He says, The role of the Spirit in interpretation is not an excuse for laziness. To pray that the Spirit would help us understand the meaning of a text because we do not want to spend time studying or using the tools that have been made available to us may border on blasphemy, for it seeks to use or misuse the Spirit for our own ends. The Holy Spirit brings to the believer a blessed assurance of the truthfulness of the biblical teachings. But he, that is the Holy Spirit, cannot be manipulated to cover for laziness in the study of the Word of God. I want to exhort you uh, to work hard on this business of exegesis. I, I might as well say it right now because I may not remember to say it later. Exegesis is hard work. To, to, to study the then and the there of the text, to hear clearly what the Word of God meant, that doesn't happen easily. It's a lot more easy to move to application or homiletics. It's a lot more easy to tell a story or to a joke or two, or to spell out how a text might be relevant for your life. It's hard to kind of work through the original languages or to go back in time and understand something about Judaism or the Roman world or the ancient world in which the Old Testament took place. It's hard to look at what the whole of Scripture may say about a particular subject. It's hard to think about literary devices, which we'll talk about in our next or two sessions down. And so exegesis is not easy. It's not surprising for me that, that pastors might be tempted to shave some corners. And sometimes, you know, we fool ourselves too. You know, we, we come to the pulpit or we come to the class and we recognize it's not our best work, but hey, it was a bad week, you know. We had this, we had that. And, and then, you know, oh, so-and-so said it was the best message they heard in a while. And we kind of trick ourselves, you know. We, we develop habits that are not healthy and well. We, 
we become maybe lazy and not doing due diligence to a proper interpretation of the scripture. And then maybe we try to baptize all of this by appealing to the illuminating work of the Holy Spirit. And so please don't be one of those uh, pastors who's in the study on Saturday night or early Sunday morning because you haven't spent enough time uh, during the week in the word. Uh, God's word needs to be properly understood and proclaimed. And so pray, yes, for the presence of the Spirit. And God answers that prayer. The Spirit does help us hear God's voice and to understand its implication for us and for those to whom we're called to minister. But uh, don't shortchange this crucial step of spending time in the Word and devoting um, enough time and energy and, and, and handling the Scripture in a proper way. Well, there's a third implication that I want to share with you, and that's this. That is, we have to make sure that we have a proper balance between the Spirit and the Word. Sometimes people wrongly separate the two from each other. They, they divorce the Spirit from the Bible. There's a little saying, in fact, that, that goes like this that's very helpful. If we live by the Word alone, we dry up. If we live by the Spirit alone, we blow up. But if we live by the Word and the Spirit, we grow up. Now, there's a really good theology in this little ditty. If we live by the Word alone, in other words, if our faith is only a kind of a dry, rationalistic faith, one devoid of the infusing, life-giving presence of the Spirit, well, that's not going to go anywhere. That's just going to wither, dry up, and die. On the other hand, if we live by the Spirit alone, whoa, I mean, wild and exciting things happen. I mean, people will throw themselves down on the ground. They're slain in the Spirit. People will apparently just burst out laughing uncontrollably. I mean, uh, amazing and surprising things happen when you live by the Spirit. But unfortunately, a lot of people who do that, uh, we say in English, crash and burn. They have these highs, but then they're followed by great lows. Or there are others in their community who don't have those high experiences and they kind of doubt whether or not they have the Spirit or doubt whether or not they're a true believer. But if we live by the Word and the Spirit, right? If we recognize that the same Spirit of God speaking to believers today is the same Spirit who has spoken in the past, right? Then we realize how they have to be then in fundamental agreement. Sometimes people come to me and they say, oh, the Spirit told me this, or I just feel led by the Spirit that this is the case. And I typically will say, well, that's great, that's wonderful, but how does that compare with what the same Spirit has already said in God's Word? So we can't divorce these two from each other. There's a little quote from uh, Kevin Van Hooser, which is uh, obviously playing off of Jesus' words in John uh, 3. Uh, But Van Hooser rightly says, the spirit may blow where he wills, but not what he wills. Right? The spirit, there's a kind of a mysteriousness about the spirit. We don't know how the spirit works among hearts and lives of people. But the spirit is, again, he doesn't just speak anything that he wants. Right? It's tied into what he has already said in the word, the scriptures, the Bible. And so let me encourage you to always keep those things uh, together. Well, dear friends, that's the first principle of our hermeneutic. And remember, it's different than the other four. It's more of a subjective category. And we have to remember that, too, when we make value judgments about the Spirit. We have to also recognize that we speak and live within a larger community and that the Holy Spirit works within the larger church community. So those are our communities uh, and ways in which we ought to uh, evaluate maybe what the Spirit is saying to us. But that's the more subjective principle that kind of underlies the hermeneutical process. And uh, I can only say that in my own life, there is a sense of, desperate need for the Spirit's help. Uh, On one hand, uh, you know, preaching maybe doesn't seem so hard if you've been doing it for a while, but on the other hand, I'm always a little bit daunted when I sit down to write a sermon because I I know that for many people, they haven't opened up God's Word during the week, and this will be so crucial for them, and then somehow it raises the stakes, and you say to yourself, I want to make sure I get it right. I, I, I I, I don't want to distort what God has said in the Word. 
And so there's a powerful dependency, a powerful awareness that I need the Spirit to be present and to illuminate and to work and sanctify this process of exegesis. So that again, we can be confident about what God was saying then and there, and then with equal confidence, we can spell, it, spell, it, spell out the implications for our audience here and now. And so, dear friends, the first principle of how to read the Bible for all it's worth, and that's the Holy Spirit element.